Derek, what does being a great session player mean to you? It means that everybody leaves the session happy. To me, that's the goal. And not just necessarily happy with what I did, but like that they leave there feeling good about the day. Everyone from the engineer to the artist to whoever else was on the session with me. When, do you remember when you, you fell in love with playing guitar? You know, I got a really late start. I didn't start, you know, playing guitar at all until I was in my teens. And, and even then it was real, you know, spot here or there, just kind of picking up one around the house. Yeah, my dad was a guitar player, so we always had guitars laying around. And I'd pick one up and bang around on it for a minute, but the bug didn't hit me until I was in college in Kentucky. And, you know, I got to college and I had all this free time. I was only taking a couple classes a day and I didn't know what to do with myself for the most part. And I remember kind of going to um, one or two things. I remember coming home one weekend and asking my dad if he had a guitar that I could just take. Do you have a guitar that I can just, you know, permalone? Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, yeah. It was some like Yamaha electric guitar. Take this, something they gave him. And I remember like going to Radio Shack and like rigging together like a, an original pod, the kidney bean one, uh -huh. and like this series of like adapter, you know, <laughs> whatever rca to eighth inch from eighth inch to quarter inch to button this and i had managed to archaically kind of rig through my laptop where i could play guitar through headphones through my laptop in my dorm and play along to music that i found on you know or that i was downloading mm -hmm. and it was also a big thing too because at that point you could start like downloading videos of people playing like live videos or like their videos on mtv and and that was a period like where I did, I started to just kind of really fall in love with it because I was just doing it. I would go to class and I'd come back and, and I'd throw the headphones on and I'd make Easy Mac in the microwave in my dorm. And, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I just really went crazy about that. And, and, and then it was like, like my third semester, like I'd quit going to classes. I was going to flunk out anyway. You know, I basically withdrew before I flunked out or put, got put on suspension. And, um, and I came home and then that's kind of when I was like, Hey, I think I want to try to do this for a living. Cause I, I just don't get sick of it. Like I really enjoy it. And I know I've got miles and miles to go, but I'm happy to put the work in because I enjoy it so much. Right. Right. So that was, that was the, the big, big moment for me, you know, turn nice. point. And what, what was the first um, step at that point after that you recognize, yeah, this is something that I want to do. So what's the, what's the next step for you? I had a very real understanding of what the bar was here in Nashville. You know, I grew up here, parents are musicians. I was under no delusions that I was good enough to go work at that point. You know, I'm 18 years old, I'm maybe almost 19. Uh, you know, I, I thought I would like to give this music thing a shot, but I also knew I, I wasn't good enough yet. Like, I'll be bluntly, you know, I, I wasn't, and I wasn't going to go embarrass myself and I wasn't going to, uh, you know, put myself in, in situations to just really, you know, fall on my face bad, you know. Uh, I started waiting tables and, you know, I, all I did was, was wait tables and then come home and practice guitar. And I spent all my money, like slowly but surely buying gear, buying pedals, buying amps, like whatever. And, you know, I'd say there was like a solid 18 months or so when I got home from college that like, you know, I didn't even try to go be a guitar player. I didn't, I didn't even try to go be in someone's band or anything like that. I just, it was just practice. It was, it was go, go wait tables, come home. You know, I would go buy, um, I would go to Walmart back then, you know, and I would buy CD. I would just, I'd buy like two CDs every week. I would go buy like a, a modern or classic country record, something that was either big at the time that was on the radio or that was like, you know, Alan Jackson or something like that. And I'd go buy some other like more like pop or modern record. And I would just try to learn those records cover to cover. And that was like a week for me. And I, I would just dig in and I slowly taught myself how to write charts and just, you know, a lot of ear, a lot of just rewinding the CD over and over and over, 
you know, trying to sound out parts and trying to learn tones. And, and, and I spent, you know, like I said, about a year and a half after college of, of, of just that, that was my life. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a girlfriend and do anything. I just, I, I waited tables. I made a little bit of money. I spent all my money on guitar stuff and, and right. just eat, sleep and breathe it. That was the, that was the thing, you know? Yeah. So then or did you progress into, into playing live first focusing on kind of making your way into smaller format sessions and stuff i can trace it all back. i can trace everything back to one gig and essentially what had happened was yeah i slowly kind of started to put myself out there a little bit i started kind of playing in a rock band here in town like for free it wasn't like a paying gig it was like somebody's had a band and i was like well i'll come play guitar with you guys this is safe right Mm -hmm. and i had a couple of those things and one of the girls that I waited tables with was a singer songwriter, but she, she didn't feel comfortable accompanying herself on acoustic guitar. And I had started playing a couple shows like that with her where she was going to sing her songs and I would just go play acoustic with her. It was at one of those nights that we got done and this guy walked up to me and was like, Hey man, I know we don't know each other. I have this gig, blah, blah, blah. I can't make it. It's in a couple days. I've called every sub I know do you want to do it? Are you available? Could you, could you do this? Because I literally have no one else to call. I was like, yeah, you know, I, um, I can do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And so, you know, I, I did, I took that guy's, you know, met him the next day, got, you know, back, you couldn't email MP3s or anything. I had to go to his house right. and get CDs of the show. Mm-hmm. He gave me CDs and I wrote charts and learned the music and went and got on that bus. And, you know, I did a good enough job. And I think they were kind of mad at that guy for bailing on their gig that they just kind of kept me on. And that gig led to another gig and led to another gig and, and led to another gig. And, and uh, you know, it tr- truly just like directly from that one one show, you know, playing for the singer songwriter and the guy <laughs> that had no other options <laughs> uh-huh. came and offered me some work, you know. I think for folks that are that are trying to figure out that that path, at least from what I hear a lot, yeah. is that people are looking for either like a secure sort of thing that's gonna help them you know, mm-hmm. kind of get in, get their foot in the door somewhere or the the expectation that they, they sort of need to find an opportunity first before they kind of put themselves out there. Yeah. And what I hear more and more is that people can kind of trace it back to like this gig where this really interesting thing happened. Yeah. Whether they're putting themselves in an environment that, that is kind of trendy and then it becomes popular and that puts them in the spotlight um, or someone like yourself that just accompanies somebody at a show and then someone comes up to them and that opportunity comes and I find more and more that the... the, the the start really happens a lot from just getting out there Absolutely. as opposed to waiting for that thing that makes you feel more comfortable, which is really unique when you look at like jobs as a whole in our society, you know, because right. it's, it's uncommon, um, you know, to be like a, a plumber, for example, and like have somebody, your friend ask you to uh, fix their toilet and then somebody's going to, refer you to a company to get a, you know, get a job or get a gig or something, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I think there's two points like you, you, cause you're completely right. And you know, one thing I tell people all the time is like, you know, especially if they're looking for a starting point is it's like, man, just go places where music you like is being made. It's like as simple as that. Like go, go to shows, go out, be like, meet people. And I understand it can be hard to just put yourself out there, but like the bottom line is find places where music that you like is existing and just go there and plant yourself into the system. Right. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I, you know, I do want to be clear about is like that, that guy, you know, that came and offered me this gig. It wasn't like a good gig. You know, it was, it was like, Hey, this person, you know, just lost their record deal and only has six shows left the whole rest of the year. You know, so it, and then, and then that led to a, you know, mildly better gig, which led to a mildly better gig, which, you know, ultimately, again, about probably another year later led to one where I, that was consistent enough where I was able to quit waiting tables. And when you think about moving on later down the line in your career, what, what's your opinion on the idea of like, you know, making it? I think there's this idea that like, you're going to keep climbing the ladder and then you get to this point where you're sort of at the top and then you're just there. Yeah. And and you I, from what I've seen that is equally uncommon to just kind of remain there without any effort of continuing to grow and stuff. I, I will also say this, I you know, I've never encountered someone who felt like they reached the top rung of the ladder. <laughs> I think it's important for you to try to define relatively like what 
you think making it is. I know consistently in my life and in my career, the me from two or three years ago wouldn't have believed what the me then's life was like. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. I mean, that was true. I remember being on the road and touring a lot and starting to do some sessions and thinking like, man, wouldn't it be awesome if I just did sessions all the time and, and wasn't traveling anymore? And then you get there and it's like, man, wouldn't it be awesome if I was playing on some like cooler sessions with like musicians that have played on hit songs and then you get there and then man wouldn't it be cool if i you know and that goes on and on it might be cool if i played on a hit wow it'd be cool if i played on a couple hits wow it'd be cool if i played on a couple bigger hits wow it'd be cool and to the back to the thing of like i don't the top rung of the ladder i, I don't know that it even exists like i think there's just a new ladder <laughs> right so um when did you first start getting into sessions more like full-time where you'd, you'd kind of progress through that process and then what were the types of sessions that you were you were getting on Ooh, session ghetto that's what we're talking about <laughs> again trace it all back to one thing there was a young artist that i got a call from a friend of a friend to go be in her band and do her showcase and so we had a few rehearsals we played a couple like pre-shows off the you know off the radar that no one would see to get prepped and we did her showcase well She didn't end up getting a record deal and she changed publishing companies. And when that happened, she gave me a call and said, Hey, I'm changing publishing companies and I'm going to use the opportunity to kind of change up how I do my demos and some of the band on my demos. I know you said you do sessions or that you want to do sessions and I I like your playing. Would you come do my demo session? And that was one, that was the first one that I ever did where there was like a legitimate, like it was EMI music publishing, you know, division of capital. And we were in, you know, what I would call a, a real studio. It's a studio I still work in to this day. Station West was the very first thing I did like that. Nice. And it was the first time I walked in to a room and there were some guys that I knew that had like played on hit records. I was like, Oh, that's Gordon Moat. Wow. You know, I did that one session. We did five songs in three hours, you know, about a month went by and that same writer said, Hey, I'm going to do another session. Uh, Everybody liked you. Come, would you, we, can you do this one? It's on the 12th. Yep. I'll be there. And that time one of the co-writers came up and said, Hey, you played on one of my songs on Megan's last session. Like, I really loved it. I've got a session coming up in a few weeks. Could I get your number? I'd like to have you if you were you know, available. And that led to another thing. And then the third session, the bass player got my name. And, and it, I mean, just truly all kind of grew from that. Now, I was still touring at the time also. And but eventually the session thing grew to a point where it kind of felt like I needed to choose just based on availability and time. Mm-hmm. And, and I had some guys that I trusted that, that had kind of told me like, Hey man, you could, you, you're going to be okay. You could do this. You'll have a home here. Like you, you'll be able to do it. And, mm-hmm. and I just took those guys word for it and, and did it. And, and then kind of really never looked back. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. When you think back on that, are there any characteristics that, that you think that those individuals saw in you or heard in you that led to them r- referring you or asking you? you know, to jump on something. Some of those guys, A, just saw that I was enthusiastic and happy to be there and, and, you know, never complained. And, you know, you know, it may not be the best song those guys played on that week, but for me, it probably was because I wasn't playing on other stuff as cool as they were yet. Mm -hmm. And I also had a real reverence for, you know, the session man, for lack of a better term. And like, you know, I knew all these guys and I, I didn't come in overzealous and I was, you know, really eager to play my part and learn from those guys, you know, especially on days where there might be two electric guitar players and, you know, I'm the guy that has played on zero hit songs and this guy's played on however many hit songs. Like, I'm not going to get in like solo fights with the guy. Like I was there to, to do a job and like, you know, fulfill, like play a role. So getting in a little bit to your creative process when you're, when you're in the studio, you're listening down to the work tape, you have a chart in your hand. What are the things that you're starting to investigate and identify through the people in the room around you and, and the song that you're listening to that is going to dictate what your first move is? Bluntly, the first thing I always ask every time I'm on a session, the first thing when I walk in the door is I say, how many songs are we doing? Because I need to know how many songs they want to get done in the amount of time that we were booked to be there. 
because it does affect decisions. Plainly, that clock count affects how many times I can really like go down a rabbit hole and risk something not working right. Once I know how much time I have, you know, on a song, as I'm listening down to the chart, I'm listening to the vocal, I'm thinking about melodies that go along with the vocal, right? I'm, you know, kind of making my own opinions about dynamics of sections and and, and to, a, to a certain extent already kind of pre-plotting where I might lay out or where I really need to play or I've actually got an idea for this thing. That's stuff that's all going in, in my head, you know, as we do the listen down. I think <laughs> any session person that tells you they knew exactly what they were going to play top to bottom the first time they played the song is a liar because you, yeah. you, that first pass, it's such a, um, it's such a conversation. Like there are so many things that are happening in that first pass. You know, you, you were feeling out what the drum pattern is sometimes for the very first time. I and mean, there's times we hit a downbeat of a song and I haven't heard that guy play a note, right? You, you are figuring out what everyone else's head is at. Right. And sometimes you get to the end of that first take and you realize like, whoa, we all thought this was a different song. Everyone, this guy's playing it like a ballad and I thought we were going to rock and this is this and maybe we should have talked about some of this. And in those scenarios where it kind of you go through the first take and it's, it's clear that it's that everyone's not on the same page yet. What, where where do you decide when and when not to step in and make a suggestion or to, you know, to, to speak? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. I would say first and foremost, you know, to anybody who would be in that situation, recognize who's in charge first. If there is a like designated session leader, if the producer is very vocal or if the if the artist himself is really hands-on, really vocal, like always let them be the first people to, to try to weigh in on if something is is not right. So obviously a big part of playing on records is tone mm -hmm. when while that is also a very challenging thing to Oof. discuss without a guitar and you know Oof. and a, a pedal board in front of you are there any things that come to mind when you think about um, certain attributes or characteristics of either your rig or the way that you play um, or the instruments that you have or any of that that relates to having really great like studio tone well i think the only thing i i could say as a blanket statement is that you know, there are guitar sounds that are impressive to stand in front of. And then there are guitar sounds that sound really great recorded. And occasionally there's some overlap, but not always. Um, I, and I, I would actually say in my experience, rarely, uh, particularly when we're talking about low end and the way that that develops, you know, there's this, you know, I think there's a verbiage around guitar players. It's like, oh, thin tone. And that's like this, that's like the ultimate diss, right? It's like, yeah. oh, dude's tone was thin or my tone is thin. And it's like, oh, you know. But as you know, or as any engineer that's ever mixed a record knows, that not every sound on a track can be huge. You, you have to make decisions in the context of mixing a, a, a record. So while, you know, a standalone guitar sound might be really impressive if you stood in front of it or if you just soloed it even, right? That may not really be the best thing ultimately for the mix, you know, depending on what you're going for and, and, and you know, what you're trying to accomplish and, and bluntly what other instruments are on the session, right? You know, it's easy for ACDC to have big guitar sounds because it's just two guitars, bass, and drums, you know, but when you start adding in keyboards and fiddle and steel and, you know, all this perk and all this programming and stuff like the sonic real estate shrinks, right? Everything can't be huge and everything can't be loud, right? right. So uh, in terms of, you know, tone, I think that's another part of the, the conversation that I'm always trying to have internally is like, how much of a meal is, are, you know, are my parts in this song? Like what's, what is this, you know, star? And again, back to this thing of like, well, is this a thing that's aimed at me? Is this a guitar-driven, heavy, rocking thing? Well, I've got way more leeway. But there are times when I know it's not really electric guitar forward. 
and you're, you know, you're just crafting some parts like you, you know, you're, I call it, you know, that's the, those are the moments when you're adding crown molding, right? Mm -hmm. You're not the drywall and you're not the two by fours on that song, but you're there to add some stuff. And that's the times when sometimes the smaller, you know, sounds are what speak the most. Like they, they immediately jump out. Everyone hears them. It sounds, sounds nice and clear and, 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 and fills up, you know, a sonic space where there was a little bit of a void, right? So I think in terms of tone, we're back to our subjective conversation, right? And I think that um, instead of me thinking of like, let me pull up a badass tone for this song, it's really more like listening to everything else and being like, ah, yeah, okay, here's where I probably should live in this world sonically. And just trying to get there. And and I would always say, you know, in, in a perfect world, your engineer is always helping that conversation too, right? Like right. if you have a tracking engineer, they should always be there a part of that. Like every part, every track, like going, oh, hey, yeah, hey, cool, man. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to high pass you a little bit for this part or like, hey, play me your part. Okay, I'm going to do this. And that's all great. But my goal is always to do as much of it on mine as I can you know, get, get as close to, to, to the vision or try to help them create a, a mixed sound already coming out of the, the thing. And then whatever the engineer adds and helps and tweaks and adds to, or if it becomes a conversation, well, that's great. I always think that part of it too, like guitar tone in general, like recorded guitar tone, it shouldn't be entirely the engineer's job or entirely the guitar player's job to make it sound great. Mm -hmm. There should be a, a a conversation there, you know, right. now if you're recording at home and you're both, well, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. But for me in a perfect world is I pull up a tone that is inspiring to me. And also I feel like is appropriate. And you hear that. And the engineer hears that and they go, Oh yeah. Oh, I hear what you. Oh yeah. Cool. Okay. Hey, I'm going to do this. Hey, hold on. I'm going to switch this or like, Hey, let me, I'm going to change the blend on your mics right now because there's a cool mid-range thing I'm going to try. So they, they can enhance that, right? So the right. idea is like, you uh, you know, I pull up a thing that inspires you to tweak a thing and then I hear that back in the headphones and then that inspires the performance. Right. Like that's the, that's in a perfect world how that thing should, should happen. So when we talk about tone, it's like, well, I'll get us to a starting point, but it, it really needs to be a conversation. And that's all in the tracking spot. Then we're not even talking about what, may or may not happen to it in the mix stage, right. right, after the fact. And it's, you know, the tone conversation to, to me in general can be um, pretty comical, um, you know, particularly when, you know, people start talking about, um, you know, iconic tones or, or combinations of things because it's like, man, you know, let's talk about, well, I want, you know, these old amps, like they played on these old records. And it's like, well, first off, those amps were new when they played them. Right. <laughs> so, you know, second off, let's talk about the fact that the power coming out of the wall wasn't even the same back then, you know? And we're, we're also haven't even gotten into the discussion of the mic chain, you know, how it was mixed. They probably went to tape instead of, you know, hi-fi digital recording, all these kinds of things. And so it's like, you know, I think you can, I think you can get in trouble really quick, kind of chasing tone with, with your eyes or with a stat sheet of like, well, this is the guitar and amp that Mike Campbell played on these Tom Petty records. Why does it not sound like this? Like, well, man, uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> like no, other than the guitar and amp, nothing else about the process is the same as how they did it. So not to mention it ain't Mike Campbell. It's you, right. you know, it's your hands. It's his right. hands. There's all that kind of stuff too. So, um, you know, tonally again, it, to me, it's, it's so much reactive. I would say that the best thing someone can do is just be, be familiar with your own gear and be familiar with the variety of sounds or the things that you can coax out of the equipment that you do have. So that when you're in those moments, you know, you, if you decide like, man, I want this to be a clean thing and you know, you know how to get there quick. Right. And then have the conversation with the engineer or, or move forward, you know, but, but it's, again, we're just back to this reactive thing for me. It's always right. like, I'm a lot mm. of times I'm making the decision about what amp I'm going to use as I'm walking out there on the floor after just hearing the song for the first time, you know, and even that decision is only for the first couple parts 
Right. You know, <laughs> or maybe one part. And then I switch guitars and amps or whatever. You know, yeah. you're just always chasing that stuff. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, getting a request for like a certain vibe or influence yeah. or, you know, inspired by this old record. And mm-hmm. when you recognize that those things have so many other variables in order to recreate that, yeah. what is your go-to for trying to appease the that influence and vision of the client? We're back to the thing about like, well, I would I want to try to get you as close as, as we can. What I'm not going to do on a session is give someone the history lesson. When someone says, common one I hear a lot, is like, hey man, we just want, you know, like on those Tom Petty records, like the Mike Campbell, you know, the AC30 thing, you know, the clean chimey, and it's like, what I'm not going to do is sit there and be like, well, you know, that wasn't any AC30. He was playing like Princeton non-reverbs and tweeting deluxes. And, you know, this this 12-string thing you thought was a Rickenbacker because you saw it in a video actually wasn't a Rickenbacker. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go, I know what you're saying, and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do my best approximation based on that description, right? So I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm certainly never going to get into a game of challenging them or trying to give history lessons on sessions because that just slows everything down and nobody cares because at the end of the day, what do you want them to say? Like, Oh, well, sorry, I was wrong about what I said, but I still want that thing. (laughs) Right. Like what good does that do anybody? So you just, you just go, Oh yeah, I get it. Okay, cool. You know, I get it. You know, like whatever it is. Last dance of Mary Jane. Gotcha. Right. And you just go out there and you do your, you know, your approximation of it. You know, I'm not going to go out there and try to prove them wrong. Well, I plugged into exactly what you said. I don't know why it doesn't sound what you wanted. It's like, I know what you meant. Right. I think that's the thing is it's like, ultimately, you just want to be like, I know, what, I get it. I know what you mean. Right. And you go out there and you do that, right? Because right. that's the, again, we're back to, did they leave happy, right? Right. They're going to leave happy when they go out there and they hear the thing that they asked for, you know? Yeah. And then they're not going to give me 20 questions about it after the fact. They're not going to go, well, now, did you use the exact same signature? No, they don't care. They just, it sounds like the thing they wanted. Great. Right. Done. We can all move on now. Yeah. And in accomplishing that, what informs your knowledge to be able to decide what it is that is going to translate into that idea that they have? Well, that's the at bats. That's, that's the thing that it's really hard to get reps at because it's so situational, right? There's a, legendary bass player guy here in town named Glenn Worf. And I remember early on, I mean, he's played on every, like Dire Straits records and a million country records and, and all kinds of stuff like across tons of genres, right? And I remember asking him early on in my session career, like, you know, essentially like, man, what got any advice? And he was like, man, just listen to as much music as you can. And I really took that to heart and I still feel that way. And we're back to like not being the wrong person in the band, right? I like to think, you know, whether someone references Fleetwood Mac rumors or, uh, you know, Tom Petty or Back in Black, or they reference a Billie Eilish record, or they reference Justin Bieber, or they reference, you know, Katy Perry that I have enough in the musical library to, to just immediately go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, like the Dr. Luke direct sound, okay, yep, okay, and, and just chase that, right, and not be the wrong guy in the band. I'm fortunate that I enjoy listening to all kinds of music, right? It's always been helpful for me to just have a context of, like, when someone says, Sarah Bareilles, I go, oh, yeah. I can think in like, I can catalog some of the sounds that I know on those records. And if I don't know it, if they say a reference and I just have no clue, I'll go out into the hallway and listen to it on my phone. Talk about the beauty of the internet at this point. Right. If someone's like, man, have you heard the, the most recent record from the national? And I'm like, I have not. I'll go out in the hall and listen to it. And I can scan through three or four songs and go, oh yeah. Okay. I get the vibe at least tonally. Like I get the approach. Okay, Cool. And then you let that inform the decisions. And then that informs when I go out there, what guitars I grab and what amps I use and whatever, and maybe a conversation with the engineer. Right. But I think at the beginning, it really just has to do with your own musical library is back to like, have you, have you heard these records they're talking about? What's something that you could do or like what the role your instrument is to play on those records. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. 
So as you're in the process of mastering these principles and figuring out, getting very comfortable in the studio, um, in, in your case, you got to a point where you were commonly asked to be the band leader. Sure. Um, what do you think led to that sort of thing? Was that anything that you were ever proactive about? Or was that something that just sort of to get asked to you and something that you agreed to and what, what prepared you to be in that position? I do think for better or worse, early on, I do think I had somehow marked myself as a as a contributor. And what I mean by that is like, you know, there are people that play sessions a lot and and maybe they're just naturally on the quiet side or maybe they just don't care to to get in the the frussel when there's a, you know, big problem to be solved or whatever and and you know, when I got going, I was always a guy that was willing to jump in and try to help solve a problem or or throw an idea out or sometimes as we talked about there would be instances where a young writer would throw out a reference that some of the band didn't know and wasn't familiar with and then I was able to kind of communicate that like oh well that thing it's real four on the floor rock groove like that's what they're talking about and they'd be like oh okay gotcha right and communicate this kind of uh, obscure or maybe even ethereal reference right to like Hey, brass tacks on your instrument. This is what they mean. It's this, or like, hey, that record they're talking about. It's w- more like Patty synths and not B three. Oh, got it. Okay, cool. And they'd switch. And I think I had just kind of contributed in that way enough that when the person who usually would lead their sessions couldn't do it, they'd be like, "Well, make Derek leader. He writes clean charts, and he's he's smart, and he's contribute. He'll contribute, and and that kind of thing." And so I I think it really just kind of started that way. And then eventually, somehow you just, along the way, you somehow it just becomes that you have a reputation of that guy leads sessions. And it's, it's literally as, as simple as that. And I think people at the time too trusted, you know, not just decisions I made on the floor or my guitar playing or any of that stuff, but they trusted who I would hire, right? If they, if they, if they just said, hey, Derek, go get a band, they knew I was going to get like-minded individuals that could do the job. And, and, you know, I always took trying to finish on time very serious. I was always very prideful mm-hmm. um, in making sure we got through the songs in, in a good amount of time and no one felt stressed and no one felt hung out to dry and everyone felt listened to, you know, never trying to sell somebody on an idea because we're trying to move on, just things like that. I think, it, I think just communication, I guess that's ultimately what I'm trying to say. I think at some point, enough people in my circle just thought like, man, Derek's a good communicator. The sessions always go easy when he's there. Let's just let him lead. Mm -hmm. And that was the, you know, we're back to the, it just went easy, right? Right. They didn't leave their feeling like they had had to fight over ideas or deal with rough personalities or whatever, you know, that's always the, and, and I still feel that way to this day. Even if I'm producing an entire record, like I want everyone there to leave feeling like that was a good easy day and that they were happy about it you know so even if we're dug in on complex stuff like you can still feel you can still leave feeling really great about the day and have worked really hard like Mm -hmm. both of those things can exist you know yeah when you're in that role as producer or band leader um how do you start to make decisions on on who you hire for the sessions the the other players you know first and foremost i'm always going to ask the artist if they have preferences you know, if, uh, you know, the artist or the writer, or the producer, and, and sometimes they do have very strong, sometimes those decisions are made for you. Sometimes it's like, well, Hey, I always use so-and-so that's who I'm going to use on, you know, on keys. Okay, great. Okay, fine. You know, whatever. And sometimes it's like, um, I'm fine with anybody, but just don't hire X, you know? Okay. That's also a thing you do. But in the moments where you're really just given free reign, where they're just saying, Hey, just do it. I don't know, you know, I don't know or I don't have a preference or whatever. I'm trying to think of the the guys that for that music, guys or girls, I should say, I'm trying to think of the personnel that for that type of music, it's going to come the most natural to. For instance, if I had a track that is very pop or R&B leaning, I might 
want to find a bass player that I know that that stuff is really in their wheelhouse. And it's not that they're one dimensional or that they couldn't do something else or that another player couldn't get there or be told what to do. But I just think like, oh, you know who plays this kind of stuff all the time and is great at it is this guy. And I, and I, so I, you know, and you know, there's the old thing in Nashville of like, you know, well, all these musicians are great. Any of, any of them can play anything you tell them to. Right. Absolutely. I just kind of think like, well, but who could I get for this project that I wouldn't have to tell them that they're just they're instinctively, they're going to do that or hear this kind of song or this type type of music and just get it mm-hmm. and just feel like, you know, at least get us 95% of the the way there and you know we'd all like to think all of us session people would like to think that we're invincible or that we don't have any blind spots or whatever but all of us do all of us have blind spots or you know music that you know we've maybe it's a learned behavior like we've learned to get pretty good at xyz but it's still not like wasn't the thing we played when we were you know, young or like we didn't grow up listening to that, you know? So it's like those, those kinds of moments, like when someone wants to make an actual modern rock sounding project, it's like, well, I'm going to go to the guys that listen to that kind of stuff in high school or, or whatever, but like we're legitimate fans of that genre, not just this guy who's an amazing drummer and I'll just tell him what to play and it'll be great. It's like, well, I could just go get this guy and do that, you know? And, and sometimes it's, there are two or three candidates that all makes sense in that position. And then sometimes it's either just flip a coin or just see who's available and the decision gets made for you. It's like, mm-hmm. I'd be happy with either one of these guys. Well, he's not available. And okay, well, then it's him. Great. That'll be, that'll be awesome. So most recently in the growth and uh, trajectory timeline of your career, um, you moved into an executive role in, uh, in publishing. Um, what, what led to that um, evolution and how's it been going? Well, same thing. Someone asked me to do it. Um, a buddy of mine um, that I've worked with a lot of years, that's a producer and a publisher, this guy named Frank Rogers. The short version is, is that, you know, he just uh, wanted to uh, find a way for us to, to work together more closely on stuff. Uh, you know, we're, we're close as friends and, and uh, he's been a great mentor to me and hired me, put me on some of my first big records. And he just said, I think this would be fun. Um, if you think you'd enjoy it and we could just figure it out. And it literally started as simple as that, you know? And so, um, so yeah, you know, now I find myself, I'm, you know, the vice president of this publishing company, Spirit Music Nashville. And what's been great for me is just the opportunity to, you know, you were, you and I were talking about this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing a little, I'm, I'm way, way, way less hired gun these days. It's, it's way less, you know, have guitar, we'll travel more, uh, you know, I'm, I'm spending time on music that, you know, I'm invested in, um, you know, on a kind of a thicker level where it's, you know, either people we've, we've quote unquote discovered, or we've partnered with, or we've signed, or we're helping, or, you know, any of those things. Um, and so, you know, if I'm not out, you know, just playing guitar on someone's record or project, you know, I'm, I'm there in my studio in that building and we're, you know, we're working with songwriters and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, uh, you know, lean into a little bit of this knowledge sharing role where I can, you know, benefit, you know, new writers or young writers or writers that just haven't had some of the experiences that I have in terms of, Hey, this is kind of what I've seen in all the years of making these records. And this is, you know, this particular artist, I know they have some preferences this way and you might want to, if you're going to write a song for them, you might want to think about that and just stuff like that, you know? Um, but yeah, just the opportunity to, 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 to be kind of daily involved in making music of people that I'm, I'm a little more closely invested, uh, with, and instead of just the, the, what can sometimes be the kind of clock in clock out nature of, of, of playing sessions, you know, which was, Mm -hmm. which I had a great time doing, but um, you know, you check a few boxes and you start looking for the next thing, I guess. Um, do you, do you have any idea what's on the horizon for you next or what would be the next, uh, I'm thrilled right where I'm at. I'm in a spot where, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to make decisions at least most of the time based on purely enthusiasm. Like, is this something I want to do or not? 
I say this too a lot, you know, two things can be true at the same time is it's like, it's best job in the world. It also doesn't mean I'm not allowed to have a bad day or like complain about it sometimes. Like it's, you know, both of those things are, are, are fair game. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot, a lot of us as creatives have that ongoing process of um, finding this great fulfillment in what we do and enjoying it. But then there's always tough days. And then there's always the self reflection of whew, trying to convince yourself that you're good enough to be Ugh. where you're at and remain there and, you know, and continue there. And, um, and I think that it's not talked about a lot. I, yeah. I, I, I don't see at least people yeah. really share that as much, but I know that everyone goes through it, but on the outside you think, well, if you get to a certain point and like, once I do this, then I won't have to worry about feeling unfulfilled or feeling like I, I didn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not great or whatever. That person must never have to worry about that stuff anymore. And once I accomplish this, you know, it'll go away. No, that's right. The big, it's the biggest myth in music. There was a, um, a bass player that took me to lunch years ago when I was trying to get into sessions. And he said that, you know, he's like the crazy thing about Nashville is he said, you'll be in a room, look around at just some of the best musicians in the world. And every one of them is terrified of being found out at any moment. <laughs> and it was like, yeah. And you, you, you relate to that. I do think that there's a, um, for whatever reason in our business, the, the winds seem to wear off a little quicker than they probably should. And, and yeah, man, like I, I know like astounding musicians that have, you know, texted me after a session and been like, man, I played like shit today. Sorry. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I didn't notice like, you know, you're in your own head about that or whatever, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, that that part of it, the 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 safety part of it too, sometimes can 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 be a myth because you you always think like, well, I've heard somebody say it's like you know they think every time the phone rings that's the last time it's going to ring, you know, and it's like man, you, I get it, you get the sentiment of it, and and sometimes it goes in, you know, it ebbs and flows, and you know, at a point you just have to kind of look in the mirror and just say like, man, I I do something valuable. And as long as I'm not obviously doing something super wrong or like mistreating people, or there's not some obvious, it's kind of, you know, whatever, like, do I smell bad? And no one's told me it's like, as long <laughs> as there's nothing like that, like, you know, you're going to be fine. Like it is, it is what it is. And no one can be everywhere at once. And, and, and no one uh, baseball analogy, no one bats a thousand. Right. So even, you know, whoever you think is the greatest drummer or, or bass player or piano player or guitar player on the world, I promise you they've had an off day too. And they've had a day where they got in the car and texted somebody and be like, sorry, I played like shit. Right. No one hasn't done that. Like it's just, it's almost part of the, also another part of the job, right? Right. Yeah. I think it's important for us to talk about that and it's important for people to hear it, to, yeah. you know, to know that everyone has those days and you, you know, yeah. you're, you know, you're going through it and we're in it together and we have a lot of similarities regardless of the level that, you know, that you're at, there's, there's those things that remain the same. Oh man. Well, I would say that, you know, to me, one of the great equalizers in, in particularly in sessioning, right. Is the amount of stuff that's not within your control on a session, right. You know, you're in there trying to collaborate with four five, six, seven other musicians, sometimes an engineer, you know, you can be in an unfamiliar environment. There could be actual technical things going wrong that maybe people are unwilling to, you know, acknowledge or unable to solve or whatever the case is, you know, sometimes you don't sound like yourself in the headphones, like whatever, there's all these things. And yeah, it's just really important to remember that like on a, a tough day or a day when it, you feel like it didn't necessarily go great. It doesn't mean it's all your fault. I remember going through a period when I'd be on those sessions where I'm the only guy that hadn't played on a hit song, you know, big time engineer with credits, you know, this Bruce Ritter. And if something wasn't right or something didn't feel right or whatever, I just thought it's gotta be me. Like clearly it's me. It's not definitely not one of these guys, you know, no way could it be one of these. It's gotta be me. And ultimately, you know, you, if you, you get the at-bats enough and that, you know, the game starts to slow down a little bit and you start your awareness raises and you, you know, your hours logged in the, you know, in the flight simulator have gotten high enough and you kind of go around and go, oh, actually that wasn't me. That's his fault. You know? <laughs> and not that it's a game of pointing fingers, but it's, it, it, it's, it's nice to kind of get through that hump of realizing like, 
oh yeah, a lot of this doesn't have anything to do with me and it could, but it can affect me. Like this session could not go great of zero fault of my own. And I can leave here. You can trick yourself into leaving and thinking like, man, I couldn't think of anything cool to play. You're like, man, I was, I didn't have a good day, man. I didn't, I just didn't, I didn't think I played anything cool or I really struggled on that one solo or whatever. And then, you know, with some, you know, with some time and some clarity, you look back and you go, those songs were terrible. No wonder I couldn't think of anything to play. Absolutely. Yeah. Man, that's so great. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, You, you have masterfully navigated uh, this industry, um, <laughs> have, have, have um, not positioned yourself, but you've uh, accepted the role of being a really great leader within our community. Oh. And um, I mean, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to, to have worked with you and yeah. um, had you play on you know, records for me and stuff. I'm really grateful for you to be here because I mean, you've really set the bar for what a great session musician can be and what a great community member can be. And I'm so happy that the people mm -hmm. that are in our community are going to be able to hear your story and, and, and hopefully learn and grow from it. Well, that's, that's, that's really kind, man. I don't know what to say other than, you know, uh, no one's more surprised than me. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, oh, man. Thank you.